Japan, home to the world's most glamorous film festival. A festival that was cancelled in 2020 due to the plague. And it wasn't the only can cancellation. The International Property Fair went for six, as did the Can Lions International Creative thing. It's estimated that Cannes has lost in the region of 1 billion euros in the last year. And with the film festival postponed from May until July this year, this is a mightily challenging time for the glamour capital of the Côte d'Azur. But there's an irony to all this, because whilst the pandemic may have brought Cannes to its knees, it was a pandemic that created Cannes in the first place. This is the story of how a pandemic created Cannes. Back in 1832, when I was a lad, Cannes was just a tiny fishing village on the south coast of France. Now, a pandemic was sweeping the world. The second cholera epidemic, as it came to be known, spread from Russia into the rest of Europe in 1831. And it prompted the British government to issue a quarantine order on ships travelling from Russia to British ports. Sound familiar? It also prompted them to issue some very strange medical advice. They believed that the pandemic was spread by bad smells. I'd be a super spreader on that basis. People also believe that if you took a bath in hot mustard, you could cure yourself. Similarly, sleeping in a draft was thought to be a contributory factor. And what's bizarre is that even 20 years later, after Jon Snow, not the newsreader, but the man who gave his name to this pub on Broadwick Street in Soho, even after Jon Snow had discovered what the cause of cholera was and how it was spread amongst the population of London, many of these slightly strange ideas persisted. A bit like QAnon. By the end of 1831, it had claimed 52,000 British lives. The disease then spread into France. And Parisian hospitals were soon overwhelmed by cholera patients. The disease began in the poorer areas of the city, but it soon spread to the upper echelons. And by April, the streets were crawling with hearses. Victims were said to look like corpses in the days before they died, and they had ice-cold tongues. The disease even disrupted a society ball, and this was recorded by the German poet Heinrich Hein, who described how a group of harlequins who were part of the entertainment when suddenly the merriest of the harlequins felt a chill in his legs, took off his mask and to the amazement of all, revealed a violet blue face. Apparently at first the crowd thought the performance was part of the entertainment, but soon wagon loads were driven directly from the ball to the local hospital where they arrived in their gaudy fancy dress and promptly died. The city of Nice, which was then in the control of the Sardinians, decided to take preventative action. They 
they set up border controls to stop people entering or leaving the city. Enter a Scotsman called Henry Peter Braun. Henry Peter Braum, or First Baron Braum to give him his correct title, was a British statesman who became Lord High Chancellor, and he played a prominent role in the passing of the 1832 Reform Act and the 1833 Slavery Abolition Act. He also helped found the Edinburgh Review. And both Braum Street and Braum Place in Edinburgh are named in his memory. And when he wasn't abolishing slavery, he also found time to design a lightweight four-wheel carriage that bears his name to this day. But in 1834, Braum decided to take a holiday away from all this activity. And he went on a trip to Italy with his daughter, Eleanor Louise. Unfortunately, when he reached Nice, he fell foul of the quarantine regulations and the authorities prevented him from crossing the river Var into Nice, which forced him to take refuge in the nearby fishing village of Cannes. By all accounts, he wasn't best pleased. But he soon fell in love with the place and decided to build himself a huge Italianate villa on a hill just outside the town. A house he was to name after his daughter, Eleanor Louise. Unfortunately, by the time the first stone was laid in 1835, she was already dead. The villa was completed in 1839, and Braum invited his friends to come and see his handiwork. gentry from Queen Victoria's court visited for holidays and they quickly decided that they wanted their own slice of paradise too. Soon the town was awash with building projects. Opulent villas were built in the style of Russian Trianons and Indian palaces. Plants were introduced from around the world. From Africa came eucalyptus, from Australia, mimosa. And in 1864, the Phoenix Canonarian Cis was introduced better known to you and me as the palm tree. A tree that was to come to symbolise the French Riviera. Just 45 years later, the town had almost 50 hotels. And a thriving market in house and estate building. died in Cannes in 1868, aged 89, and he's buried there in the local cemetery. The locals were so delighted with the prosperity that Braum had brought to the town that they adopted him and even built a statue of him in bronze, which still stands in the centre of the town. Braum's villa was abandoned during the war, but then in 1949 it was divided into apartments. 
and that is how it remains to this day. And so as Can faces an uncertain 2021 along with the rest of us, it's worth reflecting that from disaster can come rebirth. And that as that great philosopher Audrey Hepburn said, to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. Mm -hmm.